I am relatively optimistic about the economy, but it's fair to ask exactly what does that mean in practice. And um, I think my big call for this year is that I expect the, um, the size of the economy to return to the pre-COVID levels uh, by the end of this year. Um, that's a lot sooner than, than most people think. Uh, I think the consensus is it might take a year or two longer uh, to return to those sorts of levels that we saw before the pandemic. And on top of that, I think that in the meantime, unemployment is going to remain relatively low and that the, the Brexit disruption that we're undoubtedly seeing at the moment will, will be short lived and that over time we'll start to see more of the benefits of Brexit coming through as well as some of the inevitable costs. So, so that's the sort of relatively optimistic view that I have. Um, I think you, you made a good point about the importance of, of stepping back and thinking about this recession from the point of view of fundamentals. It is a, you know, frankly, a, a unique recession, you know, one in 300 years recession caused by a pandemic. So we've seen this huge slump in economic activity over the last year, but um, in a sense that slump in economic activity was, was inevitable given the pandemic and almost desirable. We sort of wanted people to, to stop doing what they would normally be doing, whether that's you know, working in the way that they would normally be doing, or spending, or going to restaurants, or pubs, whatever else it might be. So we, we can't gauge the, the depth of the recession in the usual way. Instead, we need to look at things like the, the number of people who've lost their jobs, or the number of business failures. Uh, and actually, they, they've been remarkably low, considering the extent of the decline in economic activity. I think there are, there are two factors behind that. One, of course, is the enormous amounts of government support that have been provided. So that's things like the furlough scheme, but also you know, business top-up loans, business rates, and things like that. Uh, but the other thing I think that's equally important is the flexibility of the British economy. So we've seen lots of examples where uh, jobs have been lost, but new ones have been created to, to fill those gaps. Um, the UK economy is, is, is very flexible, as I say, it's very good at um, filling gaps as they arise. And the retail sector is a good example of that. So actually, overall retail sales last year were, were barely changed despite huge slump in activity because people switched from physical shops to online. That's it. I mean, there were some headlines earlier this week saying that it was the worst year on record for retail sales. Um, but if you look beyond the headline, the actual fall was 0.2%, which in a sense is, is, a, is a good news story. Now, I don't want to downplay the problems that, that many businesses face, in particular in, in the retail sector. So this has been extremely tough and, and, and some obviously have, have failed. But um, the bigger picture is that people have been able to, to switch from spending in physical shops to, to spending online. Um, and it's worth stressing that it's not just either or, a lot of physical shops now have an online presence. You know, the digital economy has allowed a lot of these businesses to survive. Now, admittedly, some of these figures have been flattered by the diversion of spending from other areas. So, for example, people have been getting more of their food and drink from supermarkets rather than going to pubs and, and restaurants. So, um, that's a slightly misleading picture uh, of overall consumer spending. But nonetheless, it does show how consumers, you know, given the chance, are very willing to, to go out and, and spend. Um, there's been a big pickup, for example, in spending on, on DIY and online clothing. So, so, so people are still happy to spend where they can, when they can. And I suspect that's an indicator of quite a lot of pent-up demand that could come through in, in 2021. Um, I suspect a lot of that pent up demand will now come through in, in services rather than rather than goods. As I say, people have been able to maintain spending on goods online. So there's an awful lot of things in the services sector that I think we're going to want to do a lot more of in 2021 than we're able to do in 2020. Household balance sheets, if you like, are, are heading into to this year in a, in a relatively good shape. If you look at the household sector in aggregate, then uh, savings have actually increased significantly. Because what's happened, of course, is that many people have seen their incomes fall, but they've seen, seen their spending fall, but even more because they, they've not been able to go out and spend as they normally do. They're not going on foreign holidays, and not going to pubs or restaurants as much as they normally do. So, so in aggregate, the household sector has, has built up quite a big surplus of, of cash that it's available to, to spend. Now, of course, there are, there are two caveats to that. One, one is you hinted at 
you know, there are some people who have been left behind uh, during this crisis. And I, I guess something like you know, 10% of, of working households are, are not in that position. They, they've either lost their job or they've had to shift into their savings to, uh, to maintain current levels of, of spending. Um, but that still leaves something like 90% of people who you know, will have that, those reserves of cash that they, they can spend. Um, the second caveat is, of course, it all depends on, on confidence. So it's all very well having you know, built up a lot of savings, but you're not necessarily going to be willing to go out and spend them if you're afraid of a number of things. And you might be afraid still about losing your job. Uh, you might be afraid about the prospect of tax increases just around the quarter, and you just want to keep some of your cash in hand to protect paper for a bigger tax bill. Uh, or, of course, you may still be reluctant to, to go out and spend because you're worried about the coronavirus. So, so the number is still, you know, potential headwinds, but I think each of those should, should ease over the year. I think, you know, as long as unemployment remains low, there are signs that people are actually becoming more lax about job security. Um, the government is now talking less and less about the urgency to, to raise taxes. And, of course, above all, with the vaccines now being rolled out, I think people are going to feel a lot more comfortable going up and spending. So, um, so consumer spending, maybe alongside business investment, is, is going to be one of the key drivers of strong economic recovery this year, probably from the second quarter onwards. Well, you're right. I mean, consumer spending will recover before business investment does. At, at the moment, there's clearly enormous amounts of, of, of spare capacity in the economy, and I, I, I think there'll be some prolonged period of uncertainty before businesses feel able to um, spend enormous amounts on, on, on new products. Just as there's pent up demand in the consumer sector, I think there's probably pent up demand in the in business sector as well. Um, and you know, many businesses have been able to build up quite substantial cash reserves, uh, borrowing costs for, for one reason or another, or, uh, you know, up at record lows for, uh, for many types of business. So there's certainly the, the potential there. Uh, it may take a little bit longer for that side of the economy to rebound compared to the consumer sector, but, but I think it will. Um, that, by the way, is also, I think, where Brexit comes in. Um, they haven't done a relative optimist on, on Brexit, but even I would acknowledge that the uncertainty since the vote to leave in the year 2016 has held back business investment um, over the last four or five years. Um, but during that period, the, the UK has retained its very high position in various league tables for attractiveness as a, as a place for international investment and as a city of being consolidated position as the uh, predominant financial centre in, in Europe. So um, once the initial uncertainty has, has, has lifted and, and once we get through this very difficult period, undoubtedly, of, of transitioning to new customs arrangements and, and being with the increase in, in non tax barriers that we use. And I think the lifting of Brexit uncertainty will provide quite a big dividend too in terms of um, restoring business investment. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think the idea of raising taxes anytime soon is, is, is completely bonkers. I mean, surely, you know, one of the lessons that we learned from you know, the recovery from the, the global recession in 2008, 2009 is that any form of austerity, whether that's through public spending cuts or, or tax increases, will simply hold back the recovery and make the fiscal position even worse than it would otherwise have been. So um, I think we should frankly dismiss the prospect of, of, of any major tax increases um, anytime soon. But I also think we, the public finances are, are not actually in as bad a state as some people think. I know, I know the headline numbers are horrendous, so you know, it may well be borrowing something like £300 billion pounds this year, which is 10 times as much as anyone would have might have expected. Um, the total amount of debt it is now £2 trillion, which is uh, more than the entire size of the economy. I mean, these are pretty much unprecedented numbers, at, at least in, in peacetime. But a number of reassuring points. First of all, we have actually been here before, in particular in the, in the wake of the, the First and the, the Second World Wars. Um, the debt was far higher as a share of the economy than, than it is now. And I think that's a, that's a good benchmark. In a sense, we're, we're fighting a war now. We're fighting a war against a, a virus rather than a, rather than a human enemy. But during those periods, we, we spend the borrow as much as we, as we need. But also, we, we've seen in the past how um, there are ways of, of getting the debt burden down uh, without raising taxes. 
um, most importantly, of course, through economic growth. And um, assuming that the economy rebounds strongly over the next few years, then annual borrowing will automatically drop sharply. You know, tax revenues will recover. We won't need a lot of these expensive schemes like the furlough scheme uh, that are boosting the deficit. So, so that will be dealt with. Um, the level of debt will remain higher for a while, so that's the accumulated stock of, of past borrowing. Um, but what matters there is, is how much it costs to finance that debt. And we know with interest rates relatively low, it's, it's pretty cheap to finance that debt. And over time, the burden of that, that debt will be eroded by the recovery in the economy. So debt as a share of GDP will automatically start to fall again as GDP itself starts to recover. So um, I, I think that this constant talk about you know, when will tax rises take place is, is the wrong emphasis. I don't think we'll need tax rises at all. Um, I think a strong economic recovery is the key to, to getting the public finances back under, under control again. Um, that said, if you've seen in past crises that you know, whenever the, the size and the role of the state increases, it's very hard to reduce it again. Um, I think the, the fact that the state had to step in and do so much over the last year has obviously encouraged those who see a much bigger role for the state going forward in all sorts of areas. And, you know, it's very hard to resist spending increases by saying there isn't any money when the government has been able to find 300 billion for effort in the past year or last year. So um, there will be more pressure on public spending. It may well be tempting to finance that through increases in tax. And there's always a lot of talk, of course, about increases in tax on corporations, uh, uh, wealth taxes as well. Um, I don't think that's economically necessary, but clearly politically it might be easier to do that. I think that's right. Just, just to expand on that as well, a lot of people say, well, OK, it, it, it's relatively cheap for the government to, to borrow now, but what happens if interest rates go up in future? Um, well, I'd almost say, well, that sounds like a good thing to me, because the reason why interest rates would go up is because the economy is returning towards more normal levels and companies find it easier to raise prices and, and, and wages are picking up. Um, in those circumstances, I think the, the boost to the public finances from a stronger economy uh, would probably more than offset any increase in the, in the interest bill. Um, equally, if inflation picks up, provided, of course, it, we don't go into the Zimbabwe territory, but if we have a few years of three or four percent inflation. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a, a disaster at all, because as you say, it reduces the, the real burden of debt. So, so even some of the things that people see as concerns, pick up in inflation and higher interest rates, I would see a potential silver lining from those as well. Well, I'll start with the, the good news. And you mentioned the, the second English lockdown in, in November. Um, as far as we can tell from all the, uh, the business surveys, it, it had a, a much smaller impact uh, on the economy than the, the first lockdown in, in, in March and, and April, um, which sort of makes sense. I mean, the, yeah, the economy has had more time to adjust, and you know, those, those people who are able to, uh, to work from home or, or keep their businesses open um, are probably much better at able to deal with the, the new restrictions than they, than they were before. Um, and there are a number of other ways that the economy is probably in a, sort of a better shape. So you know, more people working online, shopping online, uh, online teaching is probably now better and various things like that. So uh, the second lockdown seems to have a much more impact than the first. And I, I think the third lockdown will be closer to the, the second than the first as well. So um, I, the immediate impact of, of the restrictions won't be as great as it was before. But there are clearly lots of lots of risks here. I've sort of identified you know, one one big risk and, and, and two smaller ones. The, uh, the big risk, of course, come from the, the virus itself. So um, if the the current restrictions don't get on top of the, the, the virus numbers soon, in particular if, if the case numbers don't don't drop sharply over the next few weeks, then there's a chance that the uh, the restrictions will have to be extended. And that could be the final straw for many businesses that have only just survived until now. So that is, is one obvious risk. Uh, related to that, if the, if the vaccine rollout doesn't go out as, as well as, as I hope, and at the moment it seems to be going pretty well, it's, it's accelerating, it, it's well ahead of the pace of the vaccine rollout in the rest of Europe. So it's, it's a good news story, but there, there could be a problem there. So, so the big risk, obviously, are that the, the, the fallout from the pandemic turned out to be more prolonged and worse than, than currently looks likely. Uh, there are two 
relatively small risk compared to that. One is that the uh, the government messes up the economic response, so uh, that could be that you know, the March budget does include tax increases or uh, it doesn't extend the support that may still be needed for those sectors that are effectively shut down. So uh, we do indeed end up seeing a, an early withdrawal to furlough scheme, mass job losses before the economy has got back on its feet. Uh, and then the third risk is, is around Brexit. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of disruption at the moment, and that in itself is a, is a big threat for a lot of um, particularly smaller companies that import and, and, and export. Um, I think that disruption is only going to be temporary, but you know, in due course, the, the 